Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is Tony coming to you from New Zealand and with me on the show I have for the second time um, Alex Newman and um, the last discussion we had was very well liked and I thoroughly enjoyed it so I'm expecting we'll have another good one today so welcome Alex. Thank you very much it's great to be here Tony. Perhaps you could just give um, our listeners um, and viewers just a quick rundown on who you are before we get into the main topic. Sure. Uh, I'm a Christian first and foremost, and uh, for work, I'm mostly a journalist. Um, I, uh, I've been covering a lot of different topics over the years, but the United Nations and the Climate Summit has been one of the areas that I've really specialized in. Uh, the year after I graduated from journalism school, I went to my first UN Climate Summit that was in uh, Copenhagen, and I've been going to them ever since. And, and not just climate ones. I was down at the uh, UN Summit on Sustainable Development in Brazil in 2012, a very significant one. So I've been going to a lot of these UN things for a long time. And I've been uh, really focused on uh, climate issues, uh, if you want to call them that, I've been climate in air, co- air quotes, um, and also uh, international organizations like the UN, what their agenda is and where they think they're going. So uh, so these are two areas that I've specialized in quite a bit. And um, yeah, also a dad and husband and lots of other things. So, And you've got a website. Yes, uh, my personal website is libertysentinel.org. I'm a senior editor at The New American Magazine, and you can find us at thenewamerican.com. And then I write for a lot of other publications and do a lot of other things as well. Okay, so, well, actually, that's a good place to start. The last article, well, the last one I saw anyway, that you wrote at The New American is called Ahead of UN Climate Summit, Kerry and WEF argue US must pay reparations. And way down in the article somewhere there, it says the World Economic Forum and Globalist Big Business Alliance behind the Great Reset is publicly arguing that climate reparations must be top of the agenda at COP or COP27. Joni Stahl and I in the last show covered the religious aspect of um, that whole gathering Um so I would like to hear your take on some of this, uh, you know, the angles that you've been looking at on it. Yeah, I, I think the religious aspect is um, extremely significant. Um, you know, and when you go to these, you, you see the religious aspect. Um, for example, the one in Cancun, uh, when they opened it up, they, they started it off with a prayer to the Mayan goddess Ixchel. And uh, the, uh, the head of the UN FCCC at the time, uh, Cristiana Figueres, uh, she says, oh, the, uh, the Mayan goddess Ixchel is the goddess of creativity and tapestries and all these things. Right? Oh, oh, interesting. A pagan goddess of tapestries. Well, I whipped out my laptop, looked it up real quick, and turns out uh, the Mayan goddess Ixchel was actually the goddess of cannibalism, war, and human sacrifice, um, in addition to being the goddess of tapestries and creativity. So I thought it was really interesting to, to start off a climate summit with a prayer to a, the goddess of human sacrifice. Uh, extremely appropriate, actually. Um, you know, one of the greatest climate scientists alive today, his name is Dr. Roy Spencer. Uh, he works at the University of Alabama now. He was senior climate scientist at NASA. And um, he has he started uh, some years ago, many years ago, probably almost a decade ago now, calling these people uh, global warming Nazis. And uh, what he said was the, the policies that these people are advocating will literally result in the deaths of millions of people. I mean, we're talking about sacrificing millions of lives for these insane policies because you will, you will not have proper sanitation, you will not have electricity, uh, you will basically require millions, billions of people to continue to live in squalor, in, in horrific poverty under the guise of saving the planet from CO2 emissions. And so they, they were calling him a climate denier and all these things. And so finally he had enough and he said, you know what, you guys are global warming Nazis. Um, but the, the point he made is, I think, very, very important to understand. Um, this is not about saving the climate. This is about taking control over people around the world. This is about uh, taking control over entire nations. Uh, it's about enriching a tiny class of elites that, by the way, they fly in on private jets and they're going to be feasting on steak and caviar. They're going to be uh, riding around in in limousines with uh, you know trucks in front and in back filled with armed men protecting them uh, while they lecture us about how we need to eat uh, 3D printed meat and, and eat bugs and things. 
Um, so the religious component is very significant. The economic component is very significant. I mean, they're, they're talking about a total transformation of the economic system under the guise of saving us from climate change. They want to transform our energy systems uh, away from reliable, plentiful, um, abundant energy and toward these intermittent, uh, very, very expensive, uh, non-workable so-called energy sources that, uh, you know, ancestors used a thousand years ago, solar power, you know, wind power, things like this. Um very, very strange. And then, um, you know, the, the issue of the reparations, uh, this is a giant wealth redistribution scheme. They're going to be redistributing the wealth from the middle classes in the Western world, from the Japanese, the Canadians, the New Zealanders. Um, and, and by middle class, I mean middle class, right? And, and the poor. They're not talking about coming after George Soros's money. It's all in a foundation anyway. He doesn't pay taxes. Same thing with the Rockefellers and, and all these people, right? They're not going to be paying any of these climate reparations. And the, uh, the argument is really quite silly, Tony. They're saying that because uh, more advanced nations emitted more CO2 on their path to development, uh, now these more advanced nations are responsible every time there's a hurricane, a flood, a drought, a tsunami, I mean, pretty much any kind of natural disaster that could in any way be blamed on climate change then we need to pay them. And so they're throwing out numbers now. The World Economic Forum said $2 trillion almost worth of loss and damage over the coming decades. Uh, that's how much money they want to steal from Americans, from Kiwis, and they want to pump that not into the, the poorest of the poor, right? Not the people who are starving because of these idiotic policies, but rather into the bank accounts of the kleptocrats and the, the third world regimes that have kept these people in poverty. So um, it's, in my opinion, it, it's a criminal operation that we're witnessing here and uh, it's masquerading as saviors of the planet but really this is just the old-fashioned looting of the public just with uh, kind of a smiley face on it for the useful idiots to to believe that there's some good cause behind handing over all your money and all your freedom yeah well th this is the whole thing for a start i don't believe in the whole carbon uh, climate change but, you know, we're, we're carbon-based life forms anyway. So if you go to zero carbon, you must well be saying getting rid of all life um, on this planet. But uh, in, in terms of the whole thing, I think it is really designed to push everyone into a one-world government and a one-world religion, and climate is the new, new religion, environmentalism, Mother Earth worship, and this is all just an excuse and a guise for it. And, of course, I'll never even look at the... Uh, things like geoengineering, even though there's long existing patents on that, so they can muck around with the weather and, you know, direct storms and things if they want to. And then they go, look, it's climate change, it's our carbon, it's our methane, you know, when we don't really know what extent harp and things like that play in a lot of the redirecting and worsening of storms and things. But it all plays nicely into their move to, um, well, well, they don't want us all driving electric cars. I mean, that's step one towards everyone has no vehicle. That's really right. where they're going or, or, you know, no people or less people. So um, it's, all a, it's all a ruse to cover yep. something that they're not telling you. If you don't mind, Tony, I want to comment on this because you, you just hit the nail on the head. The whole premise underpinning this thing is a massive fraud. It's a fraud of gargantuan proportions. The idea that the gas we exhale, right, every person on this planet exhales something like two pounds of CO2 every single day, uh, every single human activity, whether you're turning on a light switch or eating a salad or uh, when you die, right, your body releases lots of CO2. Every single thing that you do releases large amounts of CO2. Now, um, the planet is starving for more CO2, right? Uh, I, I was interviewing uh, Trump's climate advisor, uh, Dr. William Happer. He's a physics professor at Princeton University, one of the most respected men in his field until he started exposing the climate cult. Um, he he, uh, he and I both spoke at a climate summit in Phoenix uh, some years ago, and, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, plants are designed, and I don't know what his religious beliefs are, but he said, plants are designed to live in an atmosphere with four to five times as much CO2 as we currently have in the atmosphere. Uh, and if you go back in the geologic record, if you go back in time, what you'll find is that there have been many times when CO2 levels have been 10 times higher than they are right now, right? And not only did the planet not cook, um, the planet did really well. Plants grew large, uh, agricultural production thrived, uh, people thrived. Um, and so the, the whole pseudoscientific premise from this is very, very easy to expose. Uh, I've interviewed 
dozens of, of leading scientists on this question, including, incidentally, many who come from the UN on all these different questions, right? Uh, I interviewed um, uh, Dr. Niels Axel Morner, a lead sea level reviewer for the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And he, he, we spent, he spent 30 minutes explaining to me that, first of all, anyone who talks about global sea level has no idea what they're talking about and should not be taken seriously as an expert. Some areas can have rising seas, some areas can have declining seas at the same time. Uh, he actually asked to meet me uh, along the shore of the Baltic Sea in Scandinavia. And uh, when I got there, he said, look at this line here on this rock, right? This line here, he said, was put here by the Swedish king in, I forget what year, 17 early 1700s. And he said, when the Swedish king put this line here, that was where the sea level was. Today, we're about uh, three meters above sea level, right? Um, and so he had been monitoring uh, sea levels in the South Pacific. In fact, he had been using a series of objective metrics, right? He'd look at where a tree was, and he'd been following these things for 50 years. And he said, in most of these places, sea levels are actually going down, not up. But anyways, the whole concept of glo global sea level is preposterous. So on every scientific point, we're being lied to on a massive scale. He actually told the UN IPCC, you cannot publish these lies about sea level. This is ridiculous. This is fake. This is fraudulent. You're all going to get caught and you're going to look like idiots. Uh, they published it anyway. And so he resigned uh, from the UN IPCC. And there are many scientists like that who I've spoken to on the record. And people can go back and read that over the last 10 years. So if it's not scientific, if CO2 is really not a toxic pollution that we're breathing out, what could be the motive? Well, I think the question almost answers itself. If every single thing you do produces CO2 and the UN has people believing that CO2 is toxic pollution, that we need to pay global taxes and submit to global regulations, uh, there's no area of human activity that then falls outside the scope of this regulatory regime. Every single thing you do uh, is considered to be polluting by the UN. And so they can say, wait, hey, we have way too many people, right? And Bill Gates, of course, famously said that uh, we have this equation, right? We have CO2 and then we have population and things. We got to get one of those numbers down to zero. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, abortions and vaccines. Yeah, that'll help us get the population down 10 or 15 percent. Very bizarre thing to say. But um, but this is really, I think, uh, uh, as you pointed out, there's a religious component of this. Uh, turn people away from the true God, get people worshiping the planet, Mother Earth, whatever it is, um, and, and away from the worship of the one true God who created this planet. And um, and also uh, just basically make us all into slaves, right? If, if, if the gas, the very gas that you exhale is pollution, then you uh, essentially are a polluting organism. And um, I mean, the, the implications of this are absolutely crazy. Yeah. And you mentioned the IPCC, which, was, you know, that was Morris Strong, I think, way, goes way back. And he was, his religious aspect was very pagan, new age, um, yeah, and um, well, they call him the godfather of climate change. Uh, so it goes back a long way, and they've just kind, you know, developed it to the point where they've got us now. So now for twenty twenty two with this climate summit, what are you expecting? You know, we're going to see out of COP twenty seven. Well, I, I think the money part is the big one that's left, right? Uh, they, they intend to redistribute enormous amounts of money from the struggling middle classes of the Western world to their pockets and to their allies, the, the kleptocrats and the, the United Nations officials who are responsible for this, right? I, implementing a global system of totalitarianism costs a lot of money. And so that's the, really the big question that's left to answer is how are we going to get all the money that we need to keep this fraud going, right? I mean, we've got a lot of scientists that we need on the payroll. We've got scientists. Uh, we've got a lot of governments we need to keep on the payroll, right? Because, I mean, third world governments are going to say, hey, if you don't give us big money, we're not going to play along with this dumb stuff anymore. We're going to let our people build power plants and all the rest of it. Uh, so those are all big things. Um, and, and I think they're headed into a little bit of a problematic um summit this time around, because even while they're going to be asking Europeans and Americans and Japanese to sacrifice so much, uh, we are headed into a very difficult winter right now, right? The, the Europeans especially are going to be really struggling to heat their homes, uh, to keep their factories running, to keep the lights on. Uh, they're already talking about blackouts in, in nations that haven't had blackouts for, for generations, right? Um, because of the, supposedly because of the war with uh, Russia and Ukraine. 
So uh, that's going to be really a significant component. But uh, one of the things that, that's so obvious when you go to these things, Tony, is the fact that the people at the highest levels don't even believe this themselves, right? And I'll give you a very clear example of how you can, and, and not just because they're flying in on private jets that spew more CO2 than probably, you know, three small African countries, um, but because... If they truly believed that CO2 was so bad, right? Let me let me go back a little bit. The Paris Agreement. I, I was in Paris when they signed this in, insane agreement, uh, and basically every government was able to to put down whatever pledge it wanted to. So the U.S. government, the European Union, I'm sure New Zealand government. I, I didn't. I don't even know what they signed up for, but I'm sure it was grotesque. Uh, they all agreed we're going to drastically cut our CO2 emissions. Um, Meanwhile, the communist Chinese government said, yeah, we're going to increase our CO2 emissions until at least like 2030, and then we'll think about peaking them. Uh, okay, every unit of economic output in China is drastically more CO2 intensive than that same unit of economic output would be in the United States or in Germany or in New Zealand or in Japan. So if you really believe that CO2 emissions are so deadly and so dangerous for the planet— Literally, the worst thing in the world that you could do is shut down factories and power plants in the United States so that those power plants and factories and jobs could then be rebuilt in China, where they're going to be emitting massive amounts of CO2, drastically more than they were emitting when they were in the U.S. Uh, and that's what's happening, right? Electricity costs are going up so much in Europe, in the United States, in Canada that even patriotic business owners who want to have their manufacturing facilities in the United States say, we can't, we cannot compete in a global marketplace when we have to pay eight times more for electricity in America than we could spend in China where they're building coal-fired power plants faster than we can count them. So that's how you know that these people don't believe this stuff themselves. If they truly believe CO2 was a dangerous pollution, the last thing they would want to do is ship all of our jobs and all of our factories and all of our production to China. And yet that's exactly what they are doing. So obviously, Obviously, that's not the real agenda. And I think what we're going to see here is an acceleration of this process. Um, you have uh, this huge group of governments called the G77 plus China. Uh, and the name is a little bit misleading, right? It, it implies that there are 77. There were 77. Now there are about 134, which uh, is about two thirds of the members of the UN General Assembly. So do the math. If they control two thirds of the votes in the General Assembly and they're advocating for the General Assembly to become a kind of a parliament, a global parliament, they, they said it should be the emblem of global sovereignty. Well, when this alliance is saying we are going to bankrupt your economies, we are going to take a whole bunch of money for loss and damage. So every time there's a hurricane or a fire, we're going to blame you. Um, you know, it doesn't take a, a mathematician to figure out that Western countries, uh, countries that have in, in previous generations at least practiced something akin to free markets and, um, and at least some tenuous connection to biblical principles, uh, they're going to find that, uh, very rapidly that they're going to be totally outvoted, even if we did still have control over our own governments, right? Even if we didn't have young global leaders running our countries and, and selling out our sovereignty and our people at every opportunity. So um, I, I think COP27 is going to be very significant. And, and, you know, while Trump was president, they really didn't get that much accomplished because Trump basically stopped sending money. Uh, Trump got us out of the Paris Agreement. Trump said we're not playing with this. I mean, Trump had previously said multiple times that the man-made global warming hypothesis is a hoax. Uh, and so for four years, these summits went on and we went to a lot of them um, and really nothing happened except, oh, America's so evil, America's so evil. But now that they've got Biden in the White House, they are going to go full steam ahead. So I think big things will be coming out of the COP27, primarily uh, massive looting of the middle classes of what's left of the Western world, what used to be called Christendom. Do, well, do you think there'll be any sort of backlash, you know, from the population in general? Like you mentioned Europe with their whole... Uh, so the situation with winter and um, everything coming along there. And um, y y there's got to come a point where I guess people have a breaking point where they go, we we're not going to take this, you know. But is that going to happen or or is everyone just so worn out and tired that they're just doing what they're told completely now as pretty much most of the world did under COVID restrictions? Yeah, I, I think we're seeing some of both, right? And, and one of the really interesting ones that I've been following is Sweden. Um, and, and I spent many years living in Sweden. And the Swedish, the new Swedish government just elected uh, is very conservative. Um, uh, in fact, the kingmakers there are the uh, they call them far right. They're they're not really far right, but um, you know they they advocate less immigration and things like that. 
And um, they actually, uh, one of their first acts when they came in, this new government, was they abolished the uh, Environment and Climate Ministry. And the, the global warmists are absolutely freaking out, right? there. oh, how could Sweden do this, right? Sweden's always been the leader of global warming stuff. So if even the Swedes are sick of <laughs> the global warming stuff, uh, I suspect that uh, people all across the Western world are going to come very rapidly to a breaking point, especially when in, when they realize that this means they, that their children are going to be struggling, that their, their jobs are going to be shipped overseas. Um, and I mean, we've kind of seen that in the United States. Uh, gasoline prices uh, skyrocketed when Joe Biden took over. He uh, promptly canceled a bunch of pipelines. He, he ended leases for, for drilling of oil and things like that. Uh, we went from energy independent, in fact, from the United States being a net exporter of energy to now, again, uh, we have our, our authorities going and, and, and begging uh, dictatorships like the communist regime in Venezuela or the Islamist regime in Saudi Arabia, please send us more oil or gasoline prices are too expensive. It's like a clown show. Uh, and so the real question is how gullible will people be? Um, one of the things just today, actually, when we're recording this, Joe Biden put out a thing on Twitter threatening oil companies. He said, if you guys don't increase production, I'm going to increase your taxes. I mean, this is like third world dictatorship stuff. I mean, this is what you expect from people like Hugo Chavez, right? Uh, they cause a huge problem and then they go and blame the greedy companies or the the horrible energy companies or, or capitalism and free markets, right? So I think we're going to see a lot of that um, as this winter hits and, uh, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, not for you guys, obviously, <laughs> but uh, as winter hits in the Northern Northern Hemisphere, uh, Canadians, Germans, uh, uh, French people, Scandinavians, uh, they're going to be really hurting. And uh, the, the real question then is, will people believe the lies of the ruling classes, the predatory classes that are going to tell them that this is because of free markets or global warming or greedy energy companies? Or will they realize that this is all the direct result of the so-called green policies that have been uh, put in place by their own governments to sabotage their energy infrastructure, to sabotage their economies. Um, if people realize, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be a politician at that time. In fact, I'd probably be hiding in a bunker or something, because if people realize what has been done to their nations, they are going to be very, very mad. Uh, it's just a question of how gullible people will be. And um, unfortunately, after COVID, I learned uh, never underestimate people's gullibility because yeah. um you know, at least for a time, you can deceive a huge segment of the population. And uh, I expect we're going to see a lot of that. Well, I see uh, they're talking about 25 days worth of diesel only in parts of the US, you know, particularly yep. the East Coast and things. Well, I mean, that's a crazy situation. It didn't need to occur. But obviously, if you get diesel shortages, that impacts everything. Yep. Yep. I mean, you can't ship uh, farm products to grocery stores or to, to processing facilities. Uh, yeah. I mean, Americans are going to figure out here very quickly that um, actually we do need energy and we do need truckers and we do need fuel refineries and we do need pipelines because uh, a modern civilization and a modern economy that sustains us at the uh, standard of living that we've now come uh, become accustomed to uh, requires lots of energy. And you're not going to get that amount of energy from solar panels and windmills. I mean, you could cover this country with disgusting, polluting solar panels and windmills, and we're still not going to have enough reliable e electricity to power our economy. So something's got to give. And, um, you know, we've got elections coming up here very rapidly in the United States. Um, uh, all the forecasters are predicting a massive red wave where Republicans are almost certainly going to retake control of Congress. And so that's going to be an interesting um, monkey wrench in the gears. Now, uh, at the highest levels of Republican leadership, they're almost as bad as Democrats. Um, you know, many of them have already raised the white flag on the climate thing. You know, for years they resisted, but because the public made them resist. But now they're like, well, we're just going to have more conservative solutions to climate change. Like, what? You know, conservative solutions to um uh, you know, an imaginary threat is preposterous. Um, there's no such thing as a conservative solution to an imaginary threat. But uh, that's what we're being sold now. And so uh, I think a lot's going to depend on this election. John Kerry is writing checks uh, with his mouth that his bank account can't cash. Um, and so that, that's going to be the real wild card. If Republicans come in and conservative Republicans force the issue, um, all, all these promises that Joe Biden and John Kerry are making are going to be uh, unfulfilled, right? Because uh, the president doesn't have the ability to conjure money into existence. All money that is spent has to be appropriated by our House of Representatives. Um, it's almost certain that the House of Representatives is going to be in Republican hands uh, after this upcoming election. And so that's, um, that's going to be the, the real wild card here, Tony. Well, which is an interesting thing because at the same time when you get 
you get the Democrats president and in power and then you get Republicans controlling the other aspect. That's a re- another recipe for disastrous confusion and no nothing getting done and perhaps that's part of the, the, the globalist answer as well, keeping people divided. That's, you know, you had the reverse when Trump was in and you had, you know, the House and everything going to the Democrats. So, you know, it's, so it's perhaps that's exactly what they want is division. Yep. Uh Personally, I I think both sides are controlled by the same people anyway at the top. Yep. And um, yep, they are. It's two they heads of the are. same I bird, <laughs> the same double-headed phoenix, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, what 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 do you suggest that people do at this point? Uh, you know, uh, well, you know, I think one th- of the things that's important for everybody to do is to get to get up to speed on these issues. You don't have to be a PhD in climate science to know that they are lying to you. Uh, in fact, I, I've made this point many times. I've written many articles over the last 10 years on this issue that anybody, regardless of whether they have a PhD in anything, can understand. Right? These uh, climate um, cultists have been making predictions going back clear to the 1970s. And um you know, you don't have to be uh, a scientist. You don't have to understand statistics to look at the predictions that they made and then find out whether those predictions came true. And as I dug into this, I found that virtually every falsifiable prediction that these people ever made um, was not only not true, almost the opposite happened. <laughs> um, and so they, they told us that, you know, for example, uh, a really clear one. Uh, the um, the United Nations said that uh, these huge areas of the planet were going to be underwater um, by years ago. And uh, they said that uh, they were going to be losing amount, uh, huge amounts of population, that there was going to be millions, maybe billions of climate refugees fleeing from these uh, low areas. And what's really ironic is they couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, in fact, those areas that they said were going to be seeing millions of climate refugees fleeing have actually been some of the fastest growing population centers on the planet. And surprise, they're still not underwater, contrary to the predictions of the United Nations. Uh, so I encourage people to go back and, and look at these things. And uh, again, I've written many articles about this for The New American. Uh, I've done videos on it for people who prefer not to read. Uh, and it's one way that anybody, uh, a child, uh, somebody who never got any kind of formal education can look at this and say, wow, uh, you know, obviously they're lying to us. And and even if you just know the basic laws of statistics and probability, right, uh, if these people were being honest and trying to make honest and accurate predictions, you'd expect, uh, you know, even if they were just guessing they'd be right half the time and wrong half of the time. And yet they're wrong like all the time. Uh, that that doesn't happen, statistically speaking, unless we're being deceived, unless there's an agenda here. And you see that very clearly with the UN's climate models, right? They had 73 of them. Everyone predicted uh, massively accelerated warming as CO2 concentrations went up in the atmosphere. And yet we have the weather balloon data. We have the satellite data showing that temperatures were almost flat for decades during this time that they were supposed to be uh, skyrocketing upwards. So um, th- this is a, a deception of monumental proportions. Uh, and I think it's important that people understand that so that they can educate their fellow citizens, fellow fellow voters. Uh, but even more importantly than that, I think, um, you know, for Christians, you need to be in the word of God and you need to be praying because God's word speaks a lot about all these kinds of issues, about the push for a one world government, about the, the deception, about the powers and principalities that uh, uh, really we are warring against. Uh, and if you're not familiar with those things, if you're not familiar with a, a biblical understanding of, of the world and the environment and, and people's place in it, uh, it's very easy to get deceived in these, um, you know, pseudo crusades uh, for the planet. And they've even adopted some Christian rhetoric. We have to be good stewards of the planet, right? Uh, fine. We can be good stewards of the planet. But, um, you know, th- there's a, a big difference between being good stewards of what God has blessed us with and committing economic suicide in, in total opposition to biblical principles so that we can give a bunch of people who hate God and who hate God's truth, uh, a bunch more power and a bunch more money. I mean, this stuff should be very, very obvious to anyone with even rudimentary understanding. So read your Bibles, be in prayer, and get up to speed on on these lies that they're telling us so that you can educate your fellow citizens. Unfortunately, the mainstream and churches in general have gotten in behind this whole climate change agenda and all the other things that are going on, the transgender agendas and all of these other things, instead of uh, being a, a sensible voice saying no and, and pointing to scripture, they're going along with it by and large. But yeah. the, I believe these are the end days, and so Jesus predicted that signs, you know, are going to happen in the sun and the moon and the stars and the planet's going to go crazy anyway, and it's not going to be to do with uh, 
having too many cars and too many people breathing <coughs> carbon dioxide it, you know, is something far bigger in play than that. But it's a good excuse for the, you know, the anti-God, non-Christian types to go, this is the issue, it's all happening because of blah, 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 climate change and, and bigoted people and people that don't believe in it with who we need to censor. Like people like you and me, we need to be shut up <laughs> because yep. we, they want to push this thing, you know, big time. Okay, so anything that you would like to share before we look to wrap up? And again, you know, uh, you tell the listeners a bit about, you know, your book perhaps and um, and where they can find you and those things again. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Tony. And, uh, you know, there's a very prominent theologian here in the United States, and um, he, he gave uh, some really interesting remarks on this. He said, look, we live on a disposable planet, okay? God's going to burn up this whole place. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And so to, to live our lives running around with our hair on fire because— um, of CO2 emissions or methane uh, is the most ridiculous thing for a Christian to be doing. I mean, there, there are souls that are going to hell for eternity. To be concerned about cow burps uh, is absolutely ludicrous for a Christian. Uh, you know, we have uh, much more important things that we should be spending our time on than uh, solving the climate crisis. Uh, so that's important. Uh, I did write a little bit about this in my book on the deep state. You can find that. It's a deep state, the invisible government behind the scenes. Um, and uh, uh, you can follow our coverage from uh, the UN COP27 in Egypt. I'll be heading over there in about a week and a half. Uh, we'll be putting up a lot of live updates. We'll be just doing some live streams from uh, from the UN Climate Summit there. You can find it all at thenewamerican.com. Uh, but I do just want to encourage people, you know, and I, I always like to end on a, a very positive note. Uh, we know that God is already victorious. Uh, these people who are deceivers, these people who are lying to us, um, they're the ones who should be quaking in their boots because Jesus is coming back. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to be on the wrong side when that moment comes. Uh, so, you know, be encouraged, folks. If you are right with the Lord, if you are on the right side of these issues, if you are, uh, you know, Jesus put it very clearly, you're either with me or against me. So if you're with Christ, then you really have nothing significant to worry about. Yeah, you may face persecution, you may face trouble in this life, but that's nothing compared to what's coming. And so uh, we should praise the Lord for that. We should be very joyous. We should be excited. We should be happy. Um, and, and we should recognize too that, that these people who are deceived, um, you know, they, if, if they're deceived about the, the climate stuff, they're probably deceived about much more important matters as well. They need the light of the gospel. They need the truth of the scriptures. Um, and, and as Christians, we really should uh, make that a, a major focus of our time, of our efforts, of, of our spending, of our giving, because uh, that's really what matters. True. Well said. Yes. Uh, brilliant. Well, thank you for being on the show again today, Alex. And yeah, we'll have to do it again before too long. And I'd definitely be keen to get your take on the climate summit after it's been. So. Mm. Hey, well, thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be on here with you and uh, take care. God bless you. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. Cheers. Thanks, Alex. It's great. And folks, don't forget to visit and subscribe to a minute to midnight.com, our website where we put all of our shows, videos and articles and so forth. And um, we do have a YouTube channel, Rumble, BitChute and Apple Podcast channel as well. Minute to Midnight's run 100% by donations. A big thank you to the people that help us keep this running. We couldn't do it without your help. So thank you folks that donate. You can do that at our website too. And the music used I've written, played and recorded and you can download some free music at a minute to midnight.com as well. So that's it for this video. God bless. Stay safe and hopefully we'll be back with another show in a few days time. <laughs>